patients will often leave the thing that is troubling them most to the last minutes of a consultation as they're about to leave the doctor's rooms. Can you tell me about this? Several studies have been have shown that, that uh, patients save the most critical item on their agenda uh, and actually drop it just as they're leaving, which is uh, very difficult for doctors because if it's something like, for example, I haven't been able to go to the toilet for the last four days, the doctor needs to know about that well ahead of time so that they can, uh, can actually investigate and find out what the problem might be. So often it's because of embarrassment uh, about raising an issue. It's because the patient is frightened of what that symptom might present. Um, there's a variety of reasons that we don't really understand yet, but, but certainly it's common practice for patients to bring up the most pressing symptom at the end of the consultation. Often when time is short, there are patients waiting outside, it's difficult for the doctor to pick up on it. How can we get around this problem? What you're talking about is improving the efficiency of a consultation so that both doctor and patient agree on what are the important issues and they're discussed up front. One really uh, powerful study that we published uh, involved giving patients a set of questions they might like to ask their doctor. So these are generated by discussions with patients by research. And it included difficult questions like, am I going to be cured by this treatment? Uh, will I, uh, is there a way in which I can think or behave or feel about cancer that actually is protective and prolongs my chances of survival? Um, when you uh, uh, give patients the opportunity of thinking about those questions and then presenting them to the doctor, we know that the doctor addressing those up front of the consultation doubles the amount of information patients remember later. It reduces their anxiety by almost a third and most importantly, for, in terms of efficiency for both doctor and patient, it shortens the cancer consultation by about four minutes. So it's actually more efficient for patients and for doctors if the emotional issues around health are put on the table and discussed early in the consultation. And then it's as if once people have discussed and cleared the emotional clutter, as you, if you like, they're more able to take on board the discussion, remember what's discussed, uh, feel less anxious about, about what's going to happen in the future, and it's more efficient. That's all very well when a patient has a prompt sheet that you've provided, but what sort of advice do you give patients who may not have that? Should they be writing their questions down before they see the doctor? Yes, there have been studies of patients uh, coming in with their own list of questions. Uh, uh, using technology effectively is really powerful. There have been studies of uh, asking patients to email their questions to the doctor. The advantage of email, of course, is that when the doctor's busy with lots of patients to see, when they get some downtime, they can sit and review the questions that patients have emailed to them and uh, then at their leisure get together all the information they will need to give the patient a comprehensive answer. So emailing is a demonstrated way of getting a much clearer uh, and satisfying outcome for everybody involved in the consultation. A lot is said about patient-centred care and not much about the doctor who is often seen as someone who is a bit cold and removed from the suffering of their patient. Is that true? You know, at the, at the moment we're interviewing applicants for admission to the medical program and they're all delightful, warm, compassionate people. Uh, if you're dealing with life and death situations and people who are very fearful of the health consequences of whatever they're, they're dealing with, um, you have to learn how to be a little bit objective so that you can make good quality decisions on behalf of your patient. If you become so emotionally invested with the patient that you're incapable of making good quality decisions, you're not helping. Um, we've been recording uh, heart rate and skin conductance. So we wire surgeons, consultants and registrars up and measure their heart rate whilst they're telling a, a patient, uh, an actor, playing the role of a woman, that her husband has just died. And clinicians' heart rate increases by 40% in that situation. Even if they are not aware mentally of the stress they're experiencing, their bodies are saying, this is very stressful, 40% increase in heart rate. And if you're telling a woman that her husband has just died, the doctor's heart rate stays elevated all the way through until they actually say the words, he has died or he has passed away. Some doctors find that incredibly stressful, so much so that they can't bring themselves to say the words. And you see the elevation in heart rate for minutes, 
minutes afterwards. In fact, the longest we had was about eight minutes before a doctor could bring himself to say, your husband has died. So physiologically and psychologically, we know that doctors have to learn ways of managing the emotional connection with their patients so that they remain connected, but also are able to make good quality professional decisions. It's a tough line to follow. I believe that when doctors are going through training, they do consultations with actors who play the roles of patients. Can you tell me how that works? We use professional actors who are trained to play the role of a patient. Sometimes they play the role of another doctor or a nurse. Um, and the, the idea is to make it so real for the doctor that it feels like a normal day in the office, normal consultation with the patient. Um, the patients are trained on the best available evidence about what we know about the psychology of the disease, about the clinical needs of the patient, and with feedback from real patients about what it feels like to be in that situation. The amazing thing is when you do a workshop with then with a group of doctors with this highly trained actor playing the role of patient, if I say to a doctor, the way you did that is the best way to do it, the way you spoke to the patient, for example, how you told them the bad news that a husband's died, uh, is, is the best way to do it, they will sort of give that a rating of about four out of, out of 10. If I say there have been randomized clinical trials that show that the way you just did it is the best way to do it, they might give that a rating of about six out of 10. But if the patient, if the actor patient says, I love the way you just did it, they give that a rating of eight, nine out of 10. So there's something about being in a situation which I guess lots of us would like to be in, where you're doing something that's quite difficult, interacting with another human being, it'd be lovely to say, stop, time out, what do you understand about what I just said? Or what do you feel about what I just said? So working with actors gives doctors the opportunity to do that, to actually stop, get feedback from the patient. So the actors are trained very carefully to give feedback on what they've experienced. Doctors love that feedback.